Welcome and thank you for joining us today. My name is Teresa Veras and I am the Executive Director of North Wind Art, located in picturesque Port Townsend, Washington. I don't know about you, but right now I could really use a trip somewhere amazing. So this makes it really even more exciting and I've been looking forward to spending this time with you and taking this trip under the sea with the one and only Bill Kurtzinger and Ken Brower. Their deep dives and adventures together are truly awe-inspiring and I could listen to their stories over and over. Speaking of deep dives and adventures, this year has been both of those things for Northwind Art. COVID has forced all of us to make changes in our lives. And for Northwind Art, the saying, we're all in this together, meant literally coming together. In January of 2021, Port Townsend School of the Arts and Northwind Art Center formally merged as one organization with a new vision and mission to bring the transformative power of art to our community through education, exhibits, and artist support. As always, artists at every age and stage of their creative process continue to be at the heart of everything that we do. We are proud to say that by the end of this year, the new Northwind Art will have positively impacted the lives of over 500 artists, both professionally and financially, including 400 exhibiting artists and 100 teaching artists, and many more through our education, business, and networking opportunities. We couldn't have done this without the generosity and support of people just like you, and Bill, and Ken, and Billy, and Alex, and Brian, and countless others who continue to help us help artists. I truly believe that artists and art are a gift to the world, and they make this a better place to be, a more beautiful place to be. I'm gonna let Carrie Tremaine, another wonderfully generous individual who is talented on so many fronts. He's an exceptional editor, graphic designer, one of our steadfast board members, a volunteer, donors. I want him to tell you a little bit more. After all, he is the person who helped us bring Bill out from behind the lens to create this extraordinary exhibit, a beautiful book with Bill's photos and Ken's words, and the absolutely gorgeous limited edition portfolio that Bill has donated to help support our programs and scholarships. So with that, I want to thank you again for being here today and take it away, Carrie Tremaine. Hi, I'm Carrie. I was introduced to Bill Kurtzinger by a mutual friend who has written several magnificent books on the ocean and has known Bill for many years. He told me of Bill's stellar career as a National Geographic photographer. Just how stellar, I didn't fully realize until recently. But even as I got to better know Bill, and despite my long engagement with photography and photographers, he and I never really talked about his three decades in the wild. Then a few years ago, my friend and I were at a dinner party with Bill and his wife Sue at their home here in Port Townsend. After dinner, we were all full of wine and lounging in their living room. Bill had two large photographs of a group of Adelie penguins on the far wall. Maybe someone asked him, I don't remember, but suddenly Bill stood up and he started telling the story of photographing those penguins, much like the story I expect that he'll tell tonight. When I drove my writer friend home that night, he told me, that's the first time I've heard Bill talk about his photography in 10 years. Perhaps I'm something of a busybody, but I decided that Bill needed to be brought out of the shadows, that folks should know about this extraordinary man in their midst and see his extraordinary pictures. My chance came this year when two things happened. First, many years ago, I had created a fund to support social documentary photography projects around the world. We offered portfolios of prints from famous photographers to fund those grants, and we raised a lot of money. I wondered if the same idea could work here. Second, we merged Port Townsend School of the Arts with Northwind Art Center and decided to call the new organization Northwind Art. I researched the name Northwind. What was it? What did it mean? To my delight, here in the Pacific Northwest, the North Wind is the catalyst for upwelling in the ocean. Now, upwelling can be a little tricky to explain to someone who's never heard of it, but it's no exaggeration to say that it is the basis for the creation of life. Wind churns nutrients from the bottom of the ocean to the top where they combine with the sun's light to enable the growth of phytoplankton, the ocean's most basic life form. It's a creative process. It's a rising up. It's a perfect metaphor for a dynamic arts organization in a maritime town in challenging times. Later, when I pitched my idea for the portfolios, I was asked, 
Is there a way we can relate this to our theme of upwelling? I was mildly annoyed. How the heck was I supposed to do that? But the next day, on a walk, it hit me. Bill friggin' Kurtzinger, that's how. His work is all about the vitality of ocean life. And it was a twofer, my chance to bring Bill's work back into the light. Now, if it was only the exhibit, Bill might not have done it. But the portfolios were an opportunity to support the arts and this community. And this guy has an enormous heart. Sure enough, when Teresa and I pitched it to him, he said, how can I say no? With those words, we embarked on an intense four months of work to create the portfolios, an exhibit, and a book. Fortunately, this is where my friend, Brian Goodman, a wonderful photographer himself and master printer, enters the story. Many of Bill's pictures had been taken 30 or 40 years ago when printing and scanning technology was not what it is today. I reprocessed all the images using modern software. Brian printed them on his 44-inch Epson printer. And Brian is a perfectionist. He spares nothing to achieve the finest quality. I'll give you an example. Early on, we knew we wanted to foil stamp the cloth-bound folios containing the portfolio prints. This is foil stamping. You've probably seen it on first editions of important books where the type is actually pressed into the cloth. But we had trouble finding someone to do it at a reasonable price. So unbeknownst to me, Brian started scanning sites for used printing gear and announced one day that he had bought a foil stamping machine. It's a beautiful piece of mid-century industrial design, but it's tricky to get the foil and the heat and the pressure just right to create a perfect foil stamp. Brian practiced it every day until he'd nailed it. Originally, Bill had thought that we could use some prints from a 2005 retrospective of his work called Extreme Nature. The book for that, by the way, was published in nine languages in 11 countries. But when he saw Brian's prints, he declared them the best he had ever seen of his work. And that was that. In addition to the 50 portfolios, each containing five of his best images, we would have to newly print and frame the entire show. I also knew we needed a book. People need to hear Bill's story, not just see his pictures. And to hear some of the stories behind the pictures, as we had in his living room that night and as you will tonight. Bill said, Ken Brower is the one to write it. They had been friends since Ken first started traveling with him in preparation for the coffee table book, Wake of the Whale, based on Bill's photographs. That was 1979. And as it happened, I had worked with Ken when I was editor of California Magazine, and I knew he was a brilliant wordsmith. Ken agreed, and his manuscript arrived one day when I was at Brian's studio with Bill. I read it on my phone and nearly wept. It made me nostalgic for the days when I had worked with writers like Ken, whose deep knowledge and skill at description combined to create literary gold. Tonight, you and I have the privilege of sharing our evening with these two men. One is a writer who has traveled the world, enabling us to vicariously experience the thrilling beauty and sometimes the precariousness of our home planet. The other is a photographer whose artistry, transcending mere spectacle, conveys the emotional depth and beauty of his encounters with ocean wildlife. I said earlier that beginning this project, even I did not understand the significance of Bill's contribution. One who does is the current leading undersea photographer at National Geographic, Brian Scarry. I'll leave you with his words. Bill Kurtzinger is an ocean explorer, an artist, and a pioneer. In the 1960s, when scuba diving was in its infancy and TV shows featured divers on warm tropical reefs, Bill was diving hundreds of feet deep beneath Antarctic ice in a wetsuit. Bill rarely did anything that was easy. He was drawn to the nether worlds, as he likes to say, the deeper, darker, more mysterious ocean realms that not only few people 
ever get to see, but even few divers ever see. He traveled way off the beaten path to temperate and polar regions where working in the sea is extremely difficult. You can spend months in these places and end up with maybe a day or two where you're actually able to photograph. But the photos that Bill brought back were unique in the world. They were unlike anything else we were seeing. As a teenager, these were the images that stirred my soul. I looked at them over and over again and desperately wanted to experience those same moments. More than four decades later, I've been able to swim in Bill's wake and experience similar things, but I had the luxury of knowing it could be done because Bill did it first. When he did those things, he had no one else to look to. He was completely exploring the unknown. He didn't do it for fame or fortune. In fact, I think it's safe to say that he actually shunned the spotlight. He was a cowboy in the best sense of the word, working in nature, often alone, seeking answers to questions and learning. He took on immense challenges under difficult conditions. He didn't complain, and he returned with photographic poetry. Bill's photographs continue to inspire me today. I look at them often and marvel at the light the gesture and the grace that he was able to capture using photographic equipment that today seems primitive. But like I said, Bill is an artist and a pioneer. Uh, obviously, I'm Bill Kurtzinger, and this is Ken Brower. And Ken and I have uh, been working together for, gosh, how long? Since 78. Since 78. Um, what you're looking at is a quilt, which is actually a, a photograph of the covers that Ken's father, David Brower, published, both when he was uh, executive director at Sierra Club, and then he went on to Friends of the Earth. And that's, um, you're looking at the, up in the top left is um, a book titled, This is the American Earth by Ansel Adams and Nancy Newhall. And the one on the bottom right is Wake of the Whale, number 30, um, that Ken and I did together. Ken, um, tell, tell us about these books. I mean, these are, these are books that didn't really exist in North America until David Brower brought, brought them to the public. And tell us how that happened. The, um, these books, uh, these really were the first large format uh, coffee table books. People don't realize that. There have been a few books of large, uh, oversized format uh, art books, but um, nothing like this. This was a trade book. And um, when my father first tried out the idea on various uh, bookstores in San Francisco where the Sierra Club office was, they, um, the, the bookstore owner said, we can't sell this book. Uh, we don't have shelves that will accommodate this book. <laughs> and um, and Strangely, this thing about my father was that, that didn't bother him. He he figured there'd be a way, and uh, I was actually a witness to the the beginning of this. I, when I was a kid, uh, my dad used to drag us around on his on his job, and, and we went over to Ansel Adams' house in San Francisco. He dragged my bro little brother Bob and me, and I remember we, we were going to wait. We were going to talk to Ansel that day, start the conversations on on this book, and uh, it seemed like we had to wait for Ansel for you know. 40 minutes to, to me. It was probably about three minutes. But it was noon, and uh, Ansel finally made an appearance, and, and he was up uh, on the second story of this sort of balcony with a little, uh, kind of a little window where he looked, and he appeared in this, looked down, and he appeared uh, in his bathrobe. Uh, he, he was a barrel-chested guy with really skinny, knobby knees, and so my view was these was these knees, and, and, and a ratty, ratty bathrobe, and he, he greeted us. He had a had an oil voice. Uh, he sounded like he always had a cold. He, he was, in 1906, he was, uh, the San Francisco earthquake knocked him off a wall when he was, what, four years old? And broke his nose, and the doctor um, botched, the, uh, botched the surgery, so he always had this funny voice. But anyway, he greeted us, and, and I, I looked up and I thought, wow, you know, it's noon, and he's, now he's getting up. Um, that's not how it works in our house, you know. we. We get up at a normal time in the morning, and I said, "This is the life of a photographer." 
this is how artists live. That's pretty good. <laughs> and um, and, uh, and I just remember a little later we, we came back during the process of the making of the book, and I actually witnessed the the three the team of three my dad and Nancy Newhall and Ansel put this book together on a big table with photographs all spread out and um, and the text because the, the the problem was to work the text of the book to harmonize with the photographs and see how they went together. This was sort of the key to how these books worked. And I, and I, I didn't realize, but I, I was really watching this. And um, what I remember of this process was uh, the creative excitement of, of these three people. They knew they were onto something. Uh, I, I'm a little boy, but I can tell there's electricity in this room. And, and uh, it was exciting to watch. Uh, I didn't it was the first time I've watched really creative people in action. They were drinking all <laughs> toward the, this was the 1950s, middle 1950s, everybody did it. It was the Mad Men era, you know, and they didn't do it a lot, but um, Nancy was a, a, they were both big men. They could handle, handle the, their liquor. Nancy, toward the end of the afternoon, would be, it would begin to tell on her. And uh, I just remember one day when she said, she said something that, that didn't make any sense at all. I was 10 years old, 11, and it didn't make any sense. And, and, I, and I said, what? And, and uh, I saw the two men sort of look at each other. And the look said, well, that's it for, that's it for today. They weren't mad. It, was, it, was, it had been a long day. And then they really poured a big one and, and ended the evening. So this is my introduction to how, how art books are made. Well, these these art books for me, they were um, beginning of my, you know, consciousness about you know, the environment and nature. And, you know, I used to have, I used to ask for these books for Christmas and finally ended up with my favorite book of all time, which is, um, it's called Not Man Apart. Mm. And it's photographs of the Big Sur Coast with mm. poetry by my favorite poet, Robinson Jeffers. And as it happens, Ken actually worked on that book. It was the very first book you worked on. Yeah, it was the first one I did. I was, um, I had just finished my freshman year at Berkeley and uh, my dad came to me and he said the, they had a, he had a, hired a poet as an editor of this book because Robin, Robinson Jeffers' poems were going to be the text. And this guy was too much of a poet. He, he um, a little too precious, uh, I think. And, and uh, I had actually watched these, as a little boy, watched these books put together. I knew I, I had absorbed how it's done because uh, I was watching really masters at it. What you don't want when you're putting the text with pictures, you don't want uh, the literal transliteration of the image to the to the words. You don't get any gain anything if you're just describing the picture. And it's funny. It's what, it's what most people think you should do. Um, you should just have the words describe the picture. No, that doesn't give you anything greater. Um, if you if you have a complementarity between this, between the picture and the text, uh, they work together and they produce something greater, uh, 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 some greater than the, uh, a whole greater than some of the parts. And and so I got the idea, and I and I actually it was a very successful book. I was like 19, and um, and it was one of the better sellers that they did. I when I went back to Cal, I was a star. I got honors courses for the first time in my life. I was a ed book editor. <laughs> and um, from there, um, I, finished my, I finished my sophomore year. And my dad came back to me again. And he said, you know, you can finish your sophomore year. Or um, you can do a book, another book for me. Go down to Galapagos Silence for four months with Elliot Porter and do a big book for us. And it, it was just, you know, diabolical, really. Uh, uh, what, a, what a choice, you know. It ended my academic career. Um, uh, so I went down and spent four months in the Galapagos with Elliot Porter, one of the most magnificent de desert islands in the world, before the cruise ships. So we had it, we had it to ourselves. And, it, you know, there's something about a place where you reach your ma majority, where you become 21 years old, about that landscape that just always is special to you. And I I've been back a couple of times, and Galapagos is wonderful. Anyway, that was the uh, end of my academic career, the beginning of my book editing career. And in the end, I did 14 of these books for my dad. So these books were incredibly important to me. And after I started working at the Geographic, I don't know how long, eight, seven, eight years, I started to assemble a significant portfolio of just marine mammal work. You know, I bravely 
sent off a letter to David Brower, um, which listed all the species that I had, and then I had a little category as to whether they would, I had underwater or surface pictures or both, and um, sent the letter off and uh, didn't hear anything for a year. And uh, I'm sitting in, uh, in my home in Maine, and I get a phone call, and it's David Brower at the Portland airport. Come, come pick me up. I want to talk about the, the book idea you gave me. So he came, spent a couple of days, and the next thing I know, a week later, Ken shows up for three, four weeks. And we worked on the book together. He interviewed me. He looked at all my notes. I never should have given him my notes from all my assignments because he um, took my dumb things I was saying and um, actually used them. But that's okay. Um, anyway, we collaborated on Wake of the Whale. We actually went on a dolphin story together. And um, before Wake of the Whale was published, and used some of those images in, in that in, the, in that book that we worked on. So I mean, I want to start all this by saying how important it is these the, how important these books were in my life, and you know, books are everything to me still. And um, uh, listen to what your teacher says. You know? <laughs> I'm not sure the time sequence, but um, I had done a lot of these books for my dad, Navajo Country. Um, uh, just I did I done fourteen of them, and um, I was tired of doing it. I, I and uh, I was tired of the static pictures, the landscape, the Elliot Porter, the Ansel Adams, great because these people were um, just a picture of the scene. And I and I, one day I went up to the house to visit my family, and on the my dad had a piano. He's a good piano player. On top of it, I found this this these notes from this photographer, marine photographer, with all these animals in different categories that he'd photographed and. There were pictures. And I said, I'll do, I'll come back. I had to stop working for him. I'll come back and do this book because this book is um, different, you know, and, and uh, that's how it started. And, and um, he, look, this guy has all these marine mammals and he's a National Geographic photographer and he's been everywhere. Well, let's, I'll do it. And so, so I can't remember, I guess that's when, that's when he, but Portland calls on you. I guess, Jeez. yeah. It's been a great collaboration. We've we worked on a couple other things since then, but um, why don't we just start with some slideshows? Yeah. Let, I, I, this is one of the portfolio images, and I have to say, probably one of my favorite of all time. Of course, it's in the Antarctic, and there's a storm, and I'm, you know, it was an awful cloudy day, and gray, and windy, and I'm walking along uh, a, a glacier, a little bit of a glacier, um, and all of a sudden the sky just opened up and there was this shaft of light and this South Polar skua wheeling into the wind and it was just uh, only last, I don't know, maybe 10 seconds at the most, but I was able to get uh, this image and it really evokes a lot to me about the Antarctic, the, the winds and the, you know, that, that kind of a place, what a wild place it is. Of course, I'm an underwater photographer, and what I want to do most is photograph animals underwater. It took three trips to the Antarctic to, where, to, the, to when I finally was able to photograph emperor penguins underwater. And these are things you can't arrange. You can only sort of hope you're in the right place at the right time. And we were out on the, I was with a, a biological team from Scripps, and we were out on the edge of the uh, ice as it recedes down um, McMurdo Sound. I forget what they were doing, but you know, I was in the water, and all of a sudden, we were just, it just came out of nowhere. We were just surrounded by this big, big group of emperors, and they just swam all around us. And they, they, they hung around for about 20 minutes. I actually was able to jump up on that ice, um, flat ice, and reload a camera and, do, and have, a, have another go. Just a magical moment. Um, one of, one of the, my favorite moments of my whole career. When they swim underwater, they, as they accelerate, the um, air is uh, compressed out of their dense layer of feathers. And the air, of course, aids in warmth. And they have this kind of jet slipstream behind them. And it just stays, it'll stay there for some time. This is another portfolio image, which is a great example of how they swim and how fast they are and um, zooming through the water column. It's just uh, a real gift, this whole little series with emperor penguins. So imagine you're looking at um, penguins, you're on a cliff 
and below you there's a f this flat sea ice with a daily penguins on it drifting by. And um, I did this, the next set of photographs uh, with a, a bunch of a daily penguins on a flat piece of ice, except I'm elevated and I'm on a cliff looking straight down. And there wasn't any sun, there are no shadows. I grabbed my black and white camera and did a series of photographs. So then I was able to do this image and it, you know, it goes from front to back. And I can tell these are all Adelies that have been at sea because they're clean. But the cliff I'm standing on, looking down at these, this ice with the penguins on it, behind me there's a, a penguin rookery with about a quarter of a million nesting Adelie penguins in it. So and they get really dirty in the mud if they hang around too long. So I know they're fresh from the sea. And this photograph was a, was a gift of a leopard seal because a leopard seal, not this particular moment, leapt out on the ice and all those penguins turned and looked exactly in that direction, of course, as they should, because of course leopard seals are predatory to um, penguins and, and they're just amazing animals. They um, you know, swim in perfect U's. They can turn in a perfect serpentine U and swim around you and up and over you. It's, you know, they're in a three-dimensional world and it's kind of spooky. Um, uh, but this is the spookiest leopard seal picture, and you wanna, you wanna say something about that? Yeah, this is um, Bill is um, having trouble with his strobe that day. He's 120 feet down in the ocean, following a biologist doing a transect along the bottom, and and his strobe is leaking and acting up, so it's um, it's uh, flashing intermittently, randomly, and he's holding it above his head to to um, to try to keep it level because that seemed to to damp the um, the flash, and he feels a bump and he looks up and that's what he sees. You got to remember that these these animals grow 13 feet long. They're the only seal that habitually eats or ever eats um, warm-blooded animals, and they're about five. That if it's a female, 13 feet. The females are bigger, 13 feet long. It's about five times bigger than he is. So. Um, it's a moment. This this is one of my favorite pictures, and you know when I'm uh, you know dead and gone, this will this will be remembered maybe as the last penguin in the Antarctic. But I hope not. You know I sometimes look at these my images and just you know and read the news and climate change, and I just wonder what we've wrought and, and kind of sad. But there's still hope, and I I do have hope. It's funny how seldom you see one alone like that. I know, you know. Like the, the th Henry David Thoreau of the penguins or something. <laughs> well, no. Well, I was, it was on a boat, and I could see this iceberg in front of us with this lonely little penguin on it. And I ran down to the stern of the ship, and um, the boat passed pretty close to the berg and did the pictures. It was, uh, anyway. Well, this is what it looks like under eight feet of ice in the Antarctic. And all the black in this frame represents eight feet of ice with snow on it where light cannot penetrate. I've gone down, behind that diver is a, is a hole where I've already entered. And you can see actually my, the breath from my regulators going straight up. Um, I was on my way to the bottom and I turned around and saw this amazing image and um, started to do these photographs. and. The light in that just cracks in the ice were tied and current have wrenched the ice apart. And there are actually a seal hole. Has, uh, the, the diver's just gone. Uh, I've already done it. The diver's entered a seal hole and was on his way down. So when I first started diving in the Antarctic, I was in the Navy. And um, we only had quarter-inch wetsuits. And that's all, that's all I had. And... Um, uh, uh, hard to think about doing that now, but because um, you know I progressed on to dry suits as everybody does, even around here, most uh, divers wear a dry suit. I never really got too cold with this work until I ran out of film, and then I got—I've never been so cold in my whole life. And, and you know, you can't reload a camera underwater, 
So you have to really, you know, parse out these images and these moments um, and try and make sure you have something for whatever might come along. And 36 images, that's all you have. And it's uh, tricky. This is a Weddell seal that created that hole. Weddell seals are the um, kind of year-rounders in the Antarctic. They don't go north to the warmth in the Arctic, Antarctic winter. They stay there all year, maintain these breathing holes with their teeth and ch you know, chew away at the ice because they have to. They dive, they're very deep divers. They dive down uh, thousands of feet to eat um, all sorts of fish and squid or whatever, whatever they can. And um, they're a pretty amazing uh, seal. The, the other thing about this animal, when you're in the water, of course, sound travels uh, farther and faster in the, in the sea. And you can hear this incredible, these sounds they produce, this other worldly trilling is what it sounds like to me. Uh, this is a jellyfish. This is in the show. A lot of these pictures are a combination of the port five portfolio images and, and all the photographs that are on the wall at the Grover Gallery right now. This is a, a jellyfish in very clear water all the time. I never knew what I did. Uh, and in the Antarctic, you, uh, and especially this part of the Antarctic, which, which wasn't certain, the peninsula, which wasn't serviced by aircraft, only by ship, um, you had to, um, I remember the first assignment was that was the Antarctic Peninsula. Uh, the writer came down after me and he left before me and I remember handing him a, a plastic bag with everything I had done. Oh, and I didn't know what, what I had done at all. I just, and I remember getting a telegram, some sort of communication I was at Palmer Station and I got this communication and I'll never forget it said, great story in first hundred rolls, return at earliest convenience. Well, I couldn't really return for a month or so because there wasn't any way to do it. But anyway, um, that was, uh, that's how I heard that I might have had a story, my first uh, story for the Geographic. I got that story, that assignment, by the way, by talking my way into an admiral's office, a retired admiral who was, I was in the Navy, I was a Navy photographer. Uh, he was a uh, director of the Mariner Museum at Newport News. And I'm sitting in front of this guy and he's an admiral. And I'm just an E5 photo mate, but he knew my work because I had a lot of work published in, the, in Navy publications. And we talked and I showed him my portfolio and he said, well, what can I do for you? And I said, what do you, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to work for National Geographic. And in front of me, he picks a phone up and calls Gilbert Grover, who was the president of the whole society. And that's how it all started. Gilbert Grover sent me down to see the director of photography, an infamous character named Bob Gilka, who, as I walked into his office, on the door, there was a sign that said, wipe your knees before entering. <laughs> And I looked at that sign and I thought, uh-oh. <laughs> Walked in there and had my had a stack of prints and I also had a, a tray of slides and a carousel tray. And he took the, uh, the stack of prints and he put them in front of him on the desk and he started to flip them over. And I had about 20 and he looked at five and then he flipped the whole stack over. He didn't even look at the rest. And then he said to me, what else you got? And I said, um, well, blah, 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 blah. I have this carousel tray of slides. And then he looked at the slides. They had these little view systems. You could look at them in the daytime. And he would click, 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 click. And he'd pause on one or two. And um, then he said to me, well, I got an appointment. I got to go. And I just, of course, said to myself, that's it for the geographic. So I'm already out the door. And he says, hey. And I leaned back in the door and he said, send me that proposal on the Antarctic. Because I had talked up the idea of the Antarctic because I knew the Geograph Geographic had never done a story on the Antarctic Peninsula, only stories at South Pole, McMurdo, and the Polar Plateau. And the, so and the Antarctic Peninsula was the most interesting, the most biologically diverse. I got out of the Navy and 30 days later, got a phone call from the Geographic and had my first assignment. He was a really intimidating guy, intimidating guy. But. He was, but what all the photographers say about him. Love the guy. Love him. He, he would do anything for his photographers. Once you, once you 
finish wiping your knees, I guess. <laughs> but I mean, he would, I just remember we called him, when, when we sent, Bill sent stuff off, and we called him Uncle, Uncle Bob. Oh, he and, was a um, wonderful man. Wonderful. Once you were on his team, nobody touched you in that whole building. Nobody. No. You know, but even in, we did a, our first assignment together was in Hawaii off the Kona Coast doing dolphins. And, and uh, even then, the geographic would, would seldom let you, you had to send your pictures all the way back to the geographic to develop. Occasionally, they would let you a test, once. Test think, roll. A test, test roll. roll and to see that you're getting anything. But I just remember the anxiety of waiting, uh, Bill's waiting, you know, did I get it? Especially some of this underwater stuff. Mm. Um, at night, we did a month and a half at night, and, and all the animals are these tr wonderful translucent larval organisms that come into the, you know, that come into the beams of our, this, the, we had a shark cage with an automobile headlights that gather these vertical migrators, the deep scattering layer comes up, and and, but they're, they're glassy, they're glass animals, so that if, if the strobe hits the, this one surface, you get just surface detail, you, and it opaque. And, but it, so they figured out how to get the strobes in the right angles, and it came out, but, but they didn't know right away. It's just, and the tension, that, and waiting for the postman to come back with a verdict, you know, or the phone call, yeah. After a month and a half of this, I still remember this night, but one day Bill came up into the Boston Whaler, and, and he took his fins off, and he, Threw him down the deck. He said, "I quit. I'm finished." And uh, and me and Chris, we cheered. And until that moment, it's so funny. Until that moment, we didn't know how much tension we were under. Uh, but the minute that tension, and I may be true for you too. Totally. The minute totally. that tension came off, it's hey, you know. And this is his life. I mean, it's not just. <laughs> <laughs> so we are. We were the original Hawaiian blackwater divers, and um, we did it in the what year? Seventies. Well, we did it in eighty. Eighty. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Pretty exciting work. Um, we saw things that come up from the deep scattering layer nobody's ever seen before. And a matter of fact, on the um, the pearlfish, uh, scientists saw my image in the Geographic. This little fish actually it spends its life inside a, a lot, uh, section of its life inside a sea cucumber. He saw these photographs and collecting this fish in a plankton net, it just tore off this. Um, uh, what do they call that? They were. They were little filaments along yeah. the spine, and and each uh, it's a long, long, glassy eel-like animal, and but very small, and it had these little yellow pom poms all the way down it. What they were for, nobody knows. Mm. Do you remember the little? Uh, there was a little glassy uh, larval pr uh, uh, stomatopod, uh, a mantis shrimp, and th these wonderful animals mm. when they're grown. They're mm. they're they're two kinds. They're slashers and they're pounders. And the, the, the kind that punches its victim breaks them. They're little, but they break aquarium glass. There's the, a the, the tremendous speed of these things, and the slasher is fast. Anyway, here was the larva of it. And Bill, do you remember? Yeah. You touched, mm -hmm. the, you touched the thing. I didn't see this, but he touched it, and he saw a little, he felt an electric shock, and a little, the water was distorted with a little yellow cloud. Gold dust. It gold just, dust. It's exactly like gold dust. Yeah. And what that was. It was a plagic worm. It did that. That was a pelagic worm. Uh, no, that was that. A, that was a mantis shrimp, wasn't it? No, it was a oh, pelagic oh, worm. Oh, I got it wrong. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I just touched this pelagic worm to sort of maybe shove it a little bit into my frame, and I got a shock, and it was like poof of gold dust. And nobody knows color. what that was. Nope. Beautiful. Well, this is this is an iconic image um, for me. This is one of the five portfolio images, and. Geographic didn't use this picture when they had a chance, and of course, I, what they don't use, I get back, and we ended up using it um, for the cover of Wake of the Whale, Ken did. And you can speak to this image better than me, even though I, I this is one of my favorite pictures of all time. Um, I love this photograph. So. Well, when I, um, you know, I never really, I, lo I love this photograph, and, and I think I was one of the people who chose it for the cover of the book. Um, I chose the title of the book, too. Did you really? Yes, I did. Wake of the Whale. <laughs> wake okay. of the Whale. You, you were following along in the Wake of the Whale. Okay. Get it? You get it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I get but, it. But I never, until I, I, I did for um, Carrie and Teresa, I did this um, project for Northwind, I hadn't really looked at, and sort of analyzed this picture. You react to a picture in the subliminal ways, and I had never really examined my subliminal re reaction to it until I, I did this Northwind uh, captions for this picture. The bubbles. I realize how crucial the bubbles are. 
if you're a diver, you know, for one thing, it gives it, there are three or four exhalations of Bill of Bill's breath through his regulator, and you see those rising bubbles. And I, I realize what it does to the for this picture. It gives it depth because you see the the bubbles getting smaller, these rafts of bubbles getting smaller as they go up. But it also it's also a, the mark of the photographer. This is a time signature, and it's also a personal signature. It's, and it's a very intimate personal signature because it's Bill's breath. <laughs> and, it's, and it's rising toward the whale. And, um, and he couldn't have a better signature than if he wrote his name in the bottom. I mean, this is, this is the real Bill. This is the essential Bill. It's his breath. And I've noticed another bunch of bubbles. You may not be able to see it clearly. The, the highest raft of bubbles is, is breaking against the, the, the pectoral fin of this humpback. Those pectoral fins are 14 feet long, and it's, it's a little effervescent f a buzz of, of bubbles where it hits that fin. We both know, because we've touched whales, and we're not supposed to, but we've touched them, um, extremely sensitive skin. You can just barely touch a whale, and it feels you. As big as that skin is, it's, and as thick as it is, it's, it's sensitive. So that whale feels Bill. That whale feels his breath. If you've been a diver, and a, there's a diver below you, and those, it's almost a little obscene. If those bubbles come up past you, it feels kind of good. Yeah. Um, it feels kind of, t kind of tickles you. <laughs> You're sharing that experience with this whale. <laughs> You're turning the favor to your subject. So. Oh, what a, what, a, what a moment this was. I mean, these are moments a photographer lives for. I'm in Argentina uh, in a shallow bay, Golf of Nuevo or San Jose, I can't remember which one, in Patagonia. I joined um, a noted marine biologist, uh, mammalogist, Roger Payne, and his wife, Katie, uh, on this, in this place where they had a camp. These are pretty much the first underwater photographs of a right whale ever taken or published. It was just a magical assignment. You know, uh, I'm, this is a female. She's in this shallow bay to give birth. I would go out in a little zodiac. She, would, she was there every morning. And I would get in the uh, get in the slip into the water, and she didn't really care, but she would not let me get near her. She would stay that distance. That I this is the photograph I was trying to get, but she would just effortlessly swim off into the uh, gloom there, and um, I, I I couldn't do this photograph. After about ten days of trying every morning, she. One day, just stopped. And I don't know if she finally realized I wasn't a threat or she was just this pest. Is, you know, I'm just sick of this guy. I'm just going to not worry about him and whatever. But anyway, I was able to, after, after I did these images, I was able to do almost anything I wanted, swim underneath her, alongside her, whatever, and got some amazing moments. It's one of these gifts that an animal will, will give you. Oh, I did a, uh, I've done obviously big whales. I've also done little things like plankton. I've done a couple um, children's books on plankton, which is foundation of life in the sea. And after that work, I did, a, well, I was, a, I was given an award by the um, big phytoplankton organization because I discovered a new species of plankton. And there it is right there. <laughs> Her name is Blackie. I am a professional photographer. I do take pictures of my dogs, of course. <laughs> this is one of the uh, assignments that Ken and I have done together. Probably one of the roughest places in the world. One of the toughest assignments and, and, and pretty an amazing place and an amazing indigenous culture of mosquito Indians. I'm going to let Ken tell the story of this. They, these are these um, sailboats called dories, which is actually a mosquito word, by the way. Um, they build these dories and sail off the coast into this vast continental shelf, um, seagrass plain, and hunt turtles mostly. And here we are. We did this story together, and wow, what a uh, what a what a what a great story, but what a rough place to work. Yeah, we we. Um this was in 1994. It was um, not long after the, the Sandinista Mosquito Wars. The Sandinista went to war with the Mosquito Nation. 
And um, so uh, on the shore, when we were going out to these outer caves, we'd often pass, you know, amputees, guys who don't have a leg. Or you'd, you'd pass people dragging a leg, a lobster diver or, or, um, who, who got bent. And they have a huge rate of getting the bends and, um, and drag a leg or have a bad arm. It's, it's, a, it's a tough world. We, we, um, we, there's no banks. It's, it's a, the waters are completely lawless. Um, resource pirates from, from uh, Honduras come down in motherships that are armed with 50 caliber machine guns and, and uh, RPGs. And all the mosquitoes in, in uh, dories like this go out with AK-47s, Akas they call them. We had uh, two mosquito guards with uh, Akas, and um, we had one. Um, the, 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 our little team of uh, me, your assistant Eric Heiner and, and Bill, and um, we never had to use them, but it was, uh, it was fr kind of fraught. Um, there's no banks to use there, and we had to have money for fuel to get out. I, went to, I had to, get, to go to my local bank in Oakland, California, East Oakland, and um, get forty thousand dollars and put it in a money belt. You know, even that's that stage of it in my town, which is a rough town. I went to a little special room in the bank and I loaded up my money belt. And then I was looking at my rearview mirror all the way home. And then I had to go to Nicaragua and the Mosquito Coast. And I didn't, you know, ever flash my flash my money at anybody. You know, but but it was um, that's the sort of way it was. I mean, our biggest danger from really was from our two mosquito guards. It's two young guys. There's the AK and and um. These guys love to smoke right back in the aft by the engine and the, ga and the gasoline tanks. And we'd, we'd ask them to stop, and, and, and they would for a minute, and then you'd look around, there they were again. And I just, you know, I just knew we were going to go up in a ball of flame one day, but it um, never happened. But, but it, was, um, it was a tough, a tough life. We went into, um, and, and Bill had done a previous story on turtling, and we, we met a lot of turtles. Um, but... Uh, it was just, um, you know, it was a tough life. We, the life on these little casitas, um, we lived on a little, these, uh, they live way offshore in these little houses on stilts with thatched roofs. Home, home sweet home, home for sweet a home. while. Yeah. One of those casitas um, nearby where we were staying um, had a history. It was, um, every time we went out, we passed a cigar boat on the beach, wrecked. The Colombians run a cocaine up the coast and they transship it from these, they, sometimes from these little casitas. They, they shouldn't be there. These are mosquito casitas. And, and, uh, but what happened one time is the mosquitoes got tired of it. They slipped up with their AKs in there and uh, under one of these casitas, and they wiped the guys out. And it's, it's just a tough place. And uh, we had a, right beside our casita, we had a, we had a, a platform where we had our compressor. And we filled it with air. And so, the problem was these um, these guys, these mosquito guys, would borrow our air because they're they're diving um, for lobster, and we would do it for a while. But then at one point, Bill said, "You know, we got to have some air for ourselves, and we got to tell them we can't do it anymore." One of these mosquito uh, Indian guys, our good guy, he's a diver and a friend of ours, named Eddie Cabezas. He was uh, a, a black guy. You know, he, uh, mosquitoes are mixed with African escaped slaves and stuff, maroons. So you have, you have some people who look just like they're the guys in my high school I used to, you know, play basketball with. But there were also um, more Indian-looking people. So it was a very mixed, it's a huge tribe. Then it was 200,000, now it's about 700,000. It's, it's like Navajos or something. But they, but they um, Eddie said, you know, you really can't do that. You can't cut them off from the air because out here our custom is to share, you know. And, and Billy said, yeah, but Billy's tough when it comes. We can't do it. And when we told one, one guy uh, uh, this, he'd come alongside in his dory, and he had some guys with him, and we said, you can't do it. And, uh, and then he takes off mad, sets sail and takes off mad. And I'm thinking, whoa, you know, here we go. And Akas, you know, AK-47 is on board. And, and as, he, as he sails by us, uh, he... he Leans on the side, drops his door, and moons us. <laughs> and, and I'm thinking, boy, it, you know, it could be a lot worse than that. <laughs> and and um, so, so he never died or anything like that out there.
Uh, well, they're turtle hunters. They're amazing. They catch turtles in these nets they set on these this continental shelf. And um, this is one of those assignments where, you know, you um, it's kind of hard to watch, but you have to put your emotions aside about this because this is their this is their supermarket. You know, they don't they, they don't have a source of protein the way we do. And this is their main source of protein pretty much. And it's it's uh you have, you know, you have an affinity for these animals and it's tough. It's really tough, but you can't let on that you're upset. You can't let on that you might not agree with all this and I didn't, you know, um theoretically but it's just sometimes hard to watch i remember um one time getting into one of those dories it was just full the bottom was just full of turtles turned on their backs so the plastron was up a beautiful uh, yellowish color and there was no place to put my feet but but put them on top of the turtle mm -hmm. and um it was it was the strangest sensation because it was warm it was not warmth of the sun it was uh, that body heat comes through, I guess, maybe from the sun, but it was this wonderful feeling under my feet, but it was, but it was fraught because um, they're on their way out, but, but it was a, a weird kind of intimacy, but it felt great, I'm sorry to say. Yeah, the uh, turtle, the beaches in Ostia now in Costa Rica, they actually have a, I think they've established a, a take where they could go for a certain length of time and take all the eggs. If you had a license to do it, all, all the eggs you want. And, there's, uh, and then it got cut off after 24 hours and the turtles are left alone. And there's other places where I was, a, I photographed a bunch of school kids as the hatchlings were coming out. They were putting them in hats and running them down to the water and throw, chucking them in the water and giving them that, that little bit of an edge. They swim up through this nest, it's about a foot, depending on the turtle again, a foot, a foot and a half underneath the sand and um, start to pop out. And um, it's an amazing sight. It's a, one, of the, one of the spectacles of nature that I've ever witnessed. It's not always pretty because, you know, as they come out, there's everything, everything is trying to eat them. You know, and, and naturally, it's just a big a protein hit for everybody. You know, for all the birds, there's raccoons, there's well, feral dogs. Um, before they even, even when they're just eggs in the ground, people are trying to get the eggs. And once they make it to the water, there's, um, these are the frigate bird. Um, incredible predator, just picked off almost all those little turtles trying to get to the water. But just hard to watch, but that's what it is. So these are, this is another place, this is off of Michoacan in Mexico, where um, I'm off the, off the, the, bra the breaking waves, I'm beyond the breakers, the turtles made it beyond the breakers, I'm swimming, following these uh, black green turtles swimming seaward, frantically, so they would swim, uh, they would go down to about 10 or 12 feet and level off and swim in a straight line, um, and then then they would rise straight up vertically to pay off uh, an oxygen debt and go s back straight down and do that again. So I was actually able to swim directly above them as they were swimming. And, you know, on this turtle assignment, I kept thinking, you know, these hatchlings are like, you know, there's so few make it. If you ask a, a turtle biologist what, how many make it, they'll say maybe, you know, 6% of every nest of, of 60 to 90 eggs, the hatchlings is only about 6% will make it. And that's not a lot. And to me, they were starting to turn to like little, little grains of sand that were just tossed to the wind. And um, uh, I wanted to evoke that kind of um, etherealness. Is that an okay word? Mm -hmm. Anyway, this kind of etherealness in a single still image. And I'm swimming over these turtles thinking, holy, mackerel bill this is your moment this is what you've been waiting for and um then i slowed the shutter speed down on my camera at various speeds and finally was able to get this image i mean i didn't know it at the time but i was hoping i was going to get this and sure enough it ended up being a, a 
cover of the turtle story in I think ninety four says there anyway it was a so it's another example of you know you really have to think through these 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 projects and figure out what what image will will evoke the, the you know the, the essence of these animals and um, this 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 photograph is truly one of my most iconic images it's in the it's in the uh, Northwind portfolio it's one of the the big five and um, just one of the great great moments of my whole career no we don't do that geographic does not touch photographs up I mean if and anybody who's tried it uh, to foist upon the National Geographic something photoshopped um, and they find it out will never 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 work for them ever again I can tell you that it's a uh, I've watched this process of the, the turtles hitting the, the ocean a number of times myself, and, and it's um, what, what strikes me about it and what my reaction to this photograph is it's, it's very emotional because you've watched these animals get picked off uh, by, in such numbers, and these hatchlings know that, the, you know, they know um, uh, evolutionarily that this is the most crucial, perilous moment of their lives, and when they go, they just go like bombs, and they go... They go with alternate strikes when they're on land. Alternate strikes of their mm. flippers, and they scuttle like hell because this is this is it, baby, you know. And um, and when you see one of them make it like that, and I follow them in the water too, like that. It's just very emotional. The other thing to remember is is when they, and and then at the point when they hit the water, they're going this way. So somehow they make that they hit the water and they and there's this release and they go like turtles. The thing to remember is. Uh, the, the mystery is we don't see these, we don't know where they go. We still don't. When I was in the Galapagos in 66, a uh, local woman said this. It's a mystery. We don't know where they go. Still true. Uh, we don't know where they go uh, until we don't know what becomes of them until they come back as big steamer trunk females <laughs> hauling up on the beach and laying them 50 eggs and then getting back again and starting the cycle all over again. Well, this is another of assignment that Ken and I did together. Uh, this is, you know, probably 20, 15 to 20 miles off of the lee side of Kona, where you can actually take an 18-foot Boston whaler all that distance offshore. And a 12-foot zodiac in the beginning. Yeah, we had a little yeah. zodiac in the beginning. <laughs> um, uh, you don't wouldn't want to do that here, I can tell you that. But you have this, uh, this mountain behind you, and the prevailing winds are from the other side. So you're in the lee of Mauna Kea? Well, Mauna Loa, Mauna mostly, Loa yeah. which is the biggest mountain on Earth. It's yeah. the biggest shield, shield volcano on Earth and the biggest this side of uh, Olympus Ma Mons on Mars. So it's, it's big even in the scale of the solar system, and it protects you, this huge rain shadow. So it's a uh, wind shadow. Wind shadow. So it's 320 days a year. You can go out, way out. And, and we did. We worked this... We worked this water. We were first working kind of inshore on spinner dolphins, but we could not, I couldn't get an underwater picture of a spinner dolphin. We tried and tried and tried and tried. Probably Ken saw the most frustration in me on this assignment. This is the problem. Uh, these guys have to get the photograph. You know, the writer, a writer like me can fake his way through it. Uh, he, can, he, can, he can go to the library, you know. But a, but a photographer, there's no excuses. Uh, you know, weather, you know, uh, I got bit by a shark. Well, that was a good excuse. You got <laughs> off on that one. But, but, um, but, uh, but, but these guys get irritable at, at the end. I'm really testy. And um, you just have to, you know, be careful with them. So we're offshore, um, given up on spinners, and actually bumped into these uh, spotted dolphins. And we had the most magic moments with these animals. And... You know, we didn't have them. We didn't get them every day, but we went out every day and found them almost every day. It's not not every day, but mm. it was just uh, just a magic magic assignment. Mm. Uh, this is a this is a, a, a spotted a immature spotted. No, that's a spinner. Oh, is that a spinner? Yeah. Well, that's oh, okay. I got some. Look how high he is. <laughs> I know, really, yeah. evolving into a bird. But, yeah. Um, so we could get them in the air, but they yeah, wouldn't let us right. close underwater. We couldn't, we couldn't yeah. get close, so. It's amazing. They come out just spinning. Yeah. Look at the beauty of that flukes, those yeah. flukes. What sculpture, huh? That's a spotter. Spotted dolphin. Mm. Offshore. 
These, um, this is, a, this is the, the, the defense system. This is a squad of adult males. And they're often seven. Just like in the U.S. Army, I, I don't know, you know, if the dolphins borrowed it from us or, or, or we taught the dolphins, but, but there, so often there's seven of these guys. And, and they cruise around through the school. First thing you, when you're, you try to get ahead of the movement of the school and, and then get in the water. And, um, and usually we're pretty good at getting in front of them. You know, they, they're liable to turn. But you're waiting for them to come. The first thing that they have a dot on the front of their face. And the first thing you see is this, these little dots. Sort of, and you hear them because they're echolocating on you. And then the body sort of materializes around the white dot. And then they're coming at you and by you. And it's just a wonderful moment. And, and, uh, and the sound, I mean, you, you know, you don't hear the echolocation so much. You, you, you almost feel it in your body, in your chest and stuff. And through your legs. I mean, it's, it's, they're, they're, they're looking at your, your, your lungs. It's clear that they can look into your body and uh, probably see that you're an air-breathing mammal. And, um, and uh, watch your skeleton articulate as you, <laughs> as you swim toward them. And, and, then they're, and, they, and then they don't care about you. They're gone. Rough tooth that turn dolphin that turn back. One one or two dolphins turn back to look at us, but otherwise they're not interested. They keep going. They have dolphin things to do. And the interesting thing with when, when you with these spotters, when they're below you, a group like this, you see the backs and you hear whistling. You hear them communicating. When you're when they're looking at you, you hear the echolocation. And a couple of times I I saw it with with these guys. They'd be passing below the squad, and all of a sudden instantaneously they come up at you and you can't tell which one goes first it's almost as like i don't understand how they do it it's like they're a single organism but you can't see a leader says up they just all of a sudden boom they're up and they come at you and they're warning you off and they come streaking at you with a different kind of a, a very loud echolocation that's 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 punishing you know you really hear it ratchet sound at you screaming like this these four white dots coming at you and then and then they open like they, they, they as they as they speed around you it's like the sensation for you is like it's opening a flower the, the seven open up like this and they streak by you on all sides and the crazy thing and i think we've all noticed this is, is you're never afraid you probably should be but there's something about them that you just you, you don't they're not going to hurt you and they never did you know, they just, but it's absolutely beautiful because they all, they flash by and they're gone, you know. Ah, it's, 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 a, it's not something you see all the time. <laughs> um, Mahi Mahi, um, reported to be one of the fastest fish in the sea. And, um, you know, I wanted to, again, show speed a little bit by slowing down my shutter speed. And this is uh, uh, photographic evidence of mermaids. <laughs> care what anybody thinks and uh, there she is right there this is in the arctic with uh, piles of walrus on these flows this is an assignment i had a walrus assignment mr gilka gave me this assignment i want you to go on this join this crew this team and you're going to get on this boat and you're going to go to the arctic and I'm, i want you to bring back an underwater photograph and as I'm walking out the door, Mr. Goke says, oh, by the way, Cousteau was there last year and didn't get an underwater photograph of walrus. Thank you very much, Mr. Gilka. <laughs> That's how I left for this assignment. Um, the difference between the way um, Jacques Cousteau works and, and the way I work, and Ken can attest to this, is, I mean, he's just got a big crew. He's got a whole bunch of people, a lot of movie people, and it just takes a ton of people to do what he does. It's just me when I do my work, and maybe one person, one assistant. And I'm in a little rubber boat, a little Zodiac, on a beautiful evening, and we're uh, pulled over against this little open lead of ice, and I see these walrus kind of swimming in our direction, and I just quietly as possible slipped into the water, they didn't change their course and came right by me, by me, and I was able to get these this series of photographs. It's just, uh, you know, I had bested my childhood hero. Well, both. Um, before anybody goes on an assignment, before you're going to go spend somebody's money, before you take on the burden of 
bringing back the goods, you better do your research. You better talk to as many people as possible. You better learn everything you possibly can about this animal, um, its habits, where you can find it and what time of year and who knows about these animals, what scientists are working with them. So that is the job of pretty much everybody I know that um, has a, these kinds of assignments and you, you just have to do a lot of research. You, at the Geographic, it, it's the way it used to work, you were assigned a photo editor. You would sit down with the editor, photo editor, and you would sort of map out the, uh, your strategy. You would plan where you wanted to go, when you wanted to go, and most importantly, how much money you were about to spend. And um, underwater assignments are obviously more expensive than somebody walking around the, as a street photographer because you have to be hiring boats, you have assistants you have to hire, and that's that's why I always let my assistant carry all the cash. So I, I don't, I don't, I'm not the one in trouble. The um, the other thing to say about that is um, I think it, there's, it's a feedback loop. But, uh, I think your experience influences how how you read the, the scientific information because you have to be discerning about which what is good what is good information, you know. Because I think a, cer a certain amount of uh, common sense and and learning how, how being able to understand wh where the scientists are are accurate, you know. Well, I think that speaks to the fact that um, a lot of scientists and some not, but most would love to see their work featured in the National Geographic. So they're kind of some, oftentimes, not every time, and not all of them, only a few are over eager to have you join their thing. And I've gone on a couple of assignments where you get there and there's really, the species I'm supposed to photograph isn't there. And they just, anyway. <laughs> no, I never did. I, I, did meet Jacques, I did meet Jacques Cousteau once. Um, he knows all about my work, believe me. He's... Um, He's, um, he's, through his agencies, um, often asked where I did this, when I did it, how I did it, who I did it with, and I, and I never responded. <laughs> I had lunch with Cousteau once with my, with my father, and it was great. It's a restaurant where he absolutely, everybody was looking at him in the restaurant, and the nearest tables were trying to listen to what he said. And he was so, he was such a charismatic guy. He, um, he, he was telling us about his mistresses and, and, um, <laughs> you know, and, uh, uh, got, he got, I always remember this, he got really serious at one point. My dad's an environmentalist and so was, so of course he was the, the voice for the ocean, um, for most of his life and, and, uh, invaluable in that way, warning people what was happening. And he got serious and he said, you know, in, in my lifetime, in the ocean, I, I would guess the life in the ocean has declined by half in his career in the ocean. And this was in 1980, right? In fact, I had just come back from her assignment. Mm. And, um, and, you know, that's, that's one of the things we have to, that's one of the things National Geographic photographers are helping us with. Um, the people who followed Bill, Brian Scarry, uh, 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 Paul Nicklin are, are really uh, great advocates for the ocean now and speak to huge audiences. And it's one of the way art, one of the ways that art and environment intersect because um, I just wonder how, how much of life in the ocean has departed since Jack, Jacques did, um, or since that day in 1980 that he, he told me this. I went to Antarctica with Paul Nicklin. Uh, that's one of the things that Bill, Bill introduced me to. I started with Bill and I've worked with all their guys underwater, uh, except Amory Kristoff, the deep guy, and or almost all their guys I work with. Dave Dublé and Brian Scarry and Paul Nicklin and, and Flip Nicklin, uh, not related. And, and in fact, Flip's dad, we, he was with us Chuck, in Hawaii. Chuck, Chuck yeah. a guy named uh, Doug Faulkner, who people don't remember anymore. So I, I, I got to work with a lot of these guys. And um, he has this amazing Paul leopard does, seal, yeah. Paul does, of uh, this pig female, 13 feet, uh, started giving him penguins. And, um, and uh, he, he was trying to get photographs of her. And, she, she, she did these aggressive displays. He didn't go any place. Uh, and she, and I think we both, Paul and I both think she thought, well, what does he want? You know, what does this creature want? So she started bringing him penguins and, um, and she'd push him at him, you know, into his face mask and, uh, stand back and he didn't need them. And she 
get pissed off and go get another penguin. <laughs> and um, so the result was he shot literally right down the jaws of this huge canines, seal killing. They'll kill crab eater seals five times bill size uh, or, or paw size right down, shooting right down past. He's in, the camera's in the mouth. And, and you think, who could do a better picture than this? And he said to me, he said, yeah, I said, these are fantastic. He said, yeah, but, but Bill's picture, the, this picture, I wish I'd gotten this picture. <laughs> and because this, the, the mystery of the picture, the eye shine of this thing, through the bubbles, um, uh, they all appreciate this guy because he was really the first. Brian Scary, who talked earlier in this thing, said the same thing, thing to me. He had a copy of Wake of the Whale, a book Bill and I did. He says, you should see this book. It's, it's, um, it's, it's full of, it's ragged, it's dog-eared because how much he, and it's full of little um, uh, flags, little bookmarks to mark things. He, they made him want to be a marine photographer. He hadn't thought about it until then. And he, he looked at this, he read the text, he said, um, that's what I want to do. And he's extraordinary now. So this guy is really a pioneer in, in, in this business. Now I'm a coffee pioneer. Of course, I did, ended up in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And funny story about Mr. Gilka here again. Um, I proposed this story on harp seals and um, uh, had to have a helicopter. And, you know, helicopters cost a lot of money. And I walked into Mr. Gilka's office, past the wipe your knees before entering sign. And um, I explained to him what I needed. And he says, okay, Kurt Singer, you have 20 hours in this helicopter. And if I see an uh, invoice come into this building for a minute more, uh, you're in deep trouble. So I had these 20 hours to pull this off. And happily, I was able to do it. And one of the, one of the helpers I had was the actual helicopter pilot. He was totally into what we were doing, my assistant and I. We'd go out on the, on the pack ice and we'd find a place to land where there were seals and there was a hole to get down underneath the ice. And um, he became our dive tender. It was just amazing. And I don't know if we could have done it without him, but that's just how we did it. So I'd, we'd go out every day and look for a place. And um, unlike in the Antarctic where it's all flat sea ice, this is a kind of these um, pressure ridges of ice that are forced downward, not up. And um, just it can be, th this ice can be like 60 feet thick, all these convoluted ridges of frozen plates of ice and harp seals swinging, swimming comfortably among it. Of all the pictures, this is one of the pictures in the gallery at the Grover Gallery of pretty much, it's just uh, the picture people stop at and look at probably more than anything else. And it's just mm. amazing to me. I mean, I do like the picture, of course, but it's just a f really a sp speaks to people in a way I, didn't, I could never imagine. Well, talk about tension, Ken. <laughs> Diving at night off oh, of God, Kona yeah. with, um, there's, you know, there are sharks out there. And I did bump into one, but I, and I have no idea what it was, but it took off. Didn't, didn't do anything, obviously. But um, Well. It was a tense. That was probably the tensest assignment we ever did together. Yes. It's funny because um, we built this ridiculous shark, shark cage. <laughs> it, was made of, it was made of PVC pipe and plexiglass. And... <laughs> and um, and we had the automobile, Bill and Chris, our friend, uh, assistant, epoxy these automobile headlights to bring the deep scatters up. And we'd, we would turn it on early in the evening and sort of sit in the boat until the, 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 this, melt, this illuminated water was sort of a soup of this glassy stuff. And then we'd go in the water. And, and I, I remember uh, being nervous. It's night. Sharks are different at night. Uh, they're going a little faster. And... Um, and just suddenly realizing, I, because I'm a terrestrial, terrestrial animal, I was thinking laterally for danger. And then I was down there and said, wait a minute. You know, it can come from there. It can come from there. And, and, it's, um, and it really uh, spooked us. So it was very Rube Goldberg kind of oh, thing. Yeah. And it was, uh, but it, you know what? It's just a, a, rec, a, a box, like you would imagine a shark cage, with the frame was PVC pipe and clear plexi we had screwed onto it, and automobile headlights, like Ken says. And it never worked the way we wanted it to work, because we, we would dump it over from a whaler, our Boston whaler, 18-foot boat, 
st it would start we would start a drift and then we would get in the water and then we got in the cage for the first few times but everything was drifting by and away from us faster than you know we thought we'd just stand and sit in the <laughs> our cameras out the door we had this little hinge door and everything was drifting by so it was just boom so almost instantly we yeah, realized almost the first day we realized it wouldn't work it wouldn't work so it became just a little refuge yeah. so, so we would we would we wouldn't even get in in the beginning mm. it was just a place to run in case and you know a big tiger shark would have taken you know 20 you know, what, he'd go right through it well he Maybe might a, he might bump against it but yeah 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 we would have we've had a little time yeah it was a blue shark yeah okay. and it was, it was and it was a bit it was tw about 12 feet i watched this thing come towards bill and he didn't see it i mm. it's black knight I'm, mm, 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 and I put my torch on it and mm, followed it down right toward Bill. And um, he turned around at the last minute, and here was the thing in his face. And it's a blue shark. And, and, you know, this is a shark in daytime. You would never even, you would pay no attention to it because it's a, it, it never hurts people. But this shark wouldn't go. He had his camera housing, and he bumped it. The shark didn't go any place. It stayed its nose right there. And he kept bumping it. He had a bang stick, a power head, and if, he, if he could reach it. But he had to have both hands to keep this thing off. And finally, it, it did leave. But, yeah. And he came back, you know, he, you know he's, been, he's been bitten by sharks. So he, he has an extra little reason to be spooky. And, um, and uh, anyway, that was, the, that, was, that was our night work. <laughs> I couldn't really see it. I mean, that well either. It was just a big blur. But well, I can tell you it was a blue shark. Yeah. 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 It was a beautiful, big, long. It's like 12 feet. Be most beautiful shark of all and you know we talked about the shark that i bumped into in hawaii and this is the actual uh, species blue sharks but this is in a uh, sunny day during the middle of the day in the gulf of maine the most beautiful shark i think and mm -hmm. they're yeah. they travel around the atlantic um, from east to west in a big circle these are gray reef sharks and um, this is a shark i had a little trouble with once I'm not actually in the water. No one would want to be in the water uh, during this moment. Um, great reef, reef sharks kill more people than any, any shark. Yeah. More than great whites. Way these more, are, yeah. These are really the ones that... If you see an islander in the Oceania without a, without a foot or an arm, it's because of this guy here. And actually, during World War II in the Pacific Theater, this is the shark that the Navy and, wor and, Air, for and Air people wor worried the most about. Because uh, it's attracted to uh, an unusual event and would, would race to it instantly, like an airplane crashing or a ship sinking. The Historian Tiger Sharks who came to a place, uh, uh, French Frigate Shoals in the outer Hawaiian Islands, and they came for one reason, to eat albatross chicks. And just so, um, you know, this, act this albatross chick actually... Uh, was bumped up into the air and made it. But when, if, they, if they lift off from um, the, the, this little island where they were nesting uh, and don't swim beyond the breakers and the surf line, though, and they just decide to flop down in the water, there are these sharks patrolling just for that. I only tell that story um, late at night in bars with young women. <laughs> who, 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 who wants that? No, not, not true. Uh, you can read about it in the book. The, Ken actually writes about the, the shark bite in the Northwind book. You don't want me to tell about the shark? You want to tell about the shark? Well, Bill is in... in uh, I did a story on a book on uh, Carolinian, Carolinian navigation in the Central Pacific, Carolinian Islands. He was, he was there about the same time, a little earlier than me. And um, he was in the Turtle Island for... Um, for Satawa, one of the last islands where the great navigators are, and he was doing a story on this wonderful traditional navigation of the central uh, Carolina Islanders. They do it all with their heads, no instruments. They can go thousands of miles, hit their targets dead on. Dead reckoning, memorized star courses over 30 years apprenticeship. Get you, you can do this. It's an amazing system. Anyway, he's doing a story on them, and he's, he jumps overboard. They've got the They've got to West Fayuatu Atoll, and it's you know, uninhabited, and he jumps over and... Just Swimming around and snorkeling, and I'm coming up from the bottom, and I see this blur coming at my head. And I only had time to sort of protect my head, but 
put the hand up, he bit my hand, and he knocked my mask off, and then I was blind. I couldn't see anything underwater. Um, I came up to the surface, started swimming on my back, and um, he came around me um, and came back at me as I was swimming towards him, and just, he didn't um, bite me, he just raked my shoulder. But there was a big artery exposed, and I, I've seen my own tendon sheaths in my left hand, so. It was a moment, but it was a moment, um, you know, I'll never forget. And if you're wondering um, about that little movie everybody tells you about of your whole life, mm -hmm. yeah. I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did do a Grey Reef Shark story in and, and one of my covers for the magazine. And salmon. We all love salmon. This is a salmon in a a, a little river near Ketchikan in Alaska. I think they're chum running up the river and um, I was able to lay actually lay down. I had a little tank. I had to lay down in the river and really um, kind of didn't want to breathe a lot, but I had to breathe a little and the bubbles were everywhere and they'd sort of recede back into the back, back up and then I would relax and able to hold my breath and land on the bottom and they it just actually ended up just swimming right over my over my camera. This is a, a Atlantic salmon leaping over the falls on the Humber River, the mighty Humber in Newfoundland. And they're coming towards that same falls underwater. And this is a place, I looked for weeks and weeks for this place. And all of a sudden, when I got here, I knew I was, this was something special because they, it wasn't a very big, Little little bit, little body of water, maybe about twenty feet across at the most. But the the salmon had to sort of marshal in shore towards me because there wasn't any place else to go. And and you can see the falls, which is all that whiteness that they're about to leap over. It's the water spilling over, creating bubbles. And it just just spoke to me in the sense that. You know, there's there's so few of these left in the world, and it's just like they're always seem to everything seems to be in such trouble right now. Like everything's swimming in fire, and that that's what this picture evokes for me, and that's just what I wanted to do. And I just really worked as much as I could here getting these photographs. Ken, this is a book published by Northwind, you know, designed and sort of thunked up by Teresa and Carrie Tremaine. Um, and the captions of the five portfolio images and are in are all that Ken wrote. They're more more like mini essays. They're not real, just like picture captions. Are just the most amazing words I've ever had associated with my photography. I just have to say, and I've already said this many times to Ken. That's just an amazing um, bit of writing. Uh, these these mini essays about the five portfolio images just Thank you. Thank incredible. You, sir. Yeah. Oh, this. And it comes with this. Ah, portfolio. Yeah, and if you, well, if you get a portfolio, let's see, how's, I put my name up there where it shines like <laughs> that with a light. There you go. That's anyway, great. this is just an incredibly professional piece um, Carrie Tremaine has put together. Uh, I mean, I have to say, every step of the way, this whole process, and, you know, I've been in Port Townsend for 13 years. And um, I don't really, I've left my other life behind. This life I had with the National Geographic. It's not that I don't think about it, but, um, you know, I have, a, I have a new, I have a new, um, I have a new life with um, Sue Olson and Sunrise Coffee. I love the coffee business. Of course, I love Sue Olson. And um, it's, you know, I, I don't, I don't talk about this much. Um, and I was um, hoping to slink off into the sunset. Uh, and along comes Teresa Veris and Carrie Tremaine. They bludgeoned their way into Sunrise Coffee and sat at the table and said, Bill, we would like to produce a portfolio of your most iconic images. We would like to have a show of your work at the Grover Gallery. And we would like to produce a book. And how, and, and you know, uh, how could I say no to this? You know, the port, I've donated my work to the portfolio. The proceeds go entirely to Northwind Art. And um, I, I just said, wow, I, I, can't, I, can't, 
I can't ignore this. And here we are. And every step of the way, everything that's happened has been so classy and so professional. Um, the prints in the gallery um, are off the graph. I've never had my work reproduced like this. And I, ho I hope everybody gets a chance to get down to the Grover Gallery. And, and Teresa's given me another month. It's, it's now till the end of um, October. Well, this has been um, this whole exercise from start to finish with working with Teresa and everybody at North Wind, Carrie Tremaine, uh, Brian Goodman, the printer. Um, the portfolio is an amazing class act, and I hope everybody gets down to see the show, buys a portfolio and a book, and we'll be all everything will be good. That's all I have, Kenneth, unless you want to add anything. I got to say, you know, I, I um, on these big picture books, I've done a lot of production work in New York where the big printing houses are. And and uh, I, I came to Port Townsend. I didn't expect the quality of work that's gone in every single part of this project. Those prints are just the most beautiful prints. And this is Brian Goodman here. You know, the local talent. It's sort of extraordinary in this place. I, I didn't expect, as he says, classy every, in every detail. It's the advantage of the, this project that you guys are doing in Port Townsend is I, I get to revisit these, these memories. And, they, and I'm sorry, but I can't pick one. I mean, there are just so many come back. Um, uh, and that's the great thing about this kind of endeavor, to, to be able to revisit your past. What a treat. I hope you enjoyed your time with us, Bill, Ken, Northwind Art, all of our friends. Thank you again for being a part of this amazing event and all of these adventures. I don't know about you, but I really can't imagine the world without art. Life would just be soulless. Art is powerful, it connects us, it connects us to all of our people, places, and things. Art is magic, and Northwind Art is a hub of magic. Whether it's our school at Fort Warden or our two galleries downtown or any of our artist studios in Port Townsend, Northwind Arts mission and our three pillars of education, exhibits, and artist support helps artists be seen, heard, acknowledged, and it keeps them inspired. You create that and you create the positive energy that that brings in the world. I love that you've been able to connect with us today and to be able to hear Bill and Ken's amazing stories and see these stunning photographs and hear these words. And I'd recommend that you go see Bill's show while it's up at the Grover Gallery in downtown Port Townsend. It's there through October 31st. You can purchase this amazing little monograph, um, 30 pages of words by Ken Brower and images by Bill Kurt Singer, relive these stories. Or you can pay Bill's generosity forward by purchasing one of our limited edition portfolios, which includes five of Bill's most iconic images, three of which were on National Geographic cover. Follow us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, share this with your friends, watch it again. You can find all this information on our website, northwindart.org. Thank you again, and we hope to see you all very soon. Take really good care.